that parents tend to overpraise and underplay. Play is their love language, not praise. This is what you say to a kid if you want the result. You say to a kid, hey, what are you doing? Can I play too? Look at their face. See the difference? That's their love language. What does media blackout mean? It means no screens. So no phone, no iPad, no TV, no computer, nothing for 24 hours, unless they do homework. And if they have to do homework, the screen, you have to be able to see the screen to supervise that they are doing homework. Oh, my four-year-old started hitting. How can I teach him to stop? Check out my behavior board. It's completely free above. And you just put down the rule is no hitting. When he hits is a consequence. If you don't attach a cons, if you just say, no, you don't hit, no, you don't hit, you know, that's not very nice doesn't mean anything to them but all of a sudden they have to sweep the kitchen floor if they hit they might think twice and if they won't sweep the floor then they get 24 hour media blackout so yeah there has to be a consequence you make them accountable by giving them consequences what to do when a three-year-old does positive action so let's say that they hit and then you said okay let's go to the you always go to the board to do this let's go to the board so your role was no hitting and your consequence was you have to clear the table after dinner okay and then you said with no complaints. So they go and do that. They clear the table. And then within 30 seconds of hitting or clearing the table, then they hit again. What I would say is I would say, I'll tell you what, you've hit twice now today, or you've just hit twice. Usually I do it if it's three times, but you can do it now. Say, okay, so you, you hit, let's go to the board. You hit, then you did the consequence. That was great. But then you hit again. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. Because you hit again, we'll go right to the negative deprivation. So 24-hour media blackout starts now and make it happen. Ooh, it's going to get ugly. It's a good lesson for that child, though. I'll bet you they won't, they'll think twice before they hit again. They probably will. They're going to make mistakes. But they'll probably think twice before they hit again. So, yeah. And once you said it, it has to happen. And then, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. How about I do something, another chore? Well, no, it's too late. It's already started. That's how I talk. I go, well, it's already started, so it's too late. Remember I said the 24-hour media blackout starts. It's already started. So once you've said it, make it happen. you got to say what you mean and mean what you say. If you do an empty threat, oh, they've got you where they want you. Yeah, I can't do that. you got to be consistent 100% of the time. Can a consequence on the behavior board be to take away toys? That's the second consequence. Uh, the behavior board, there's one rule and there's two consequences for the kids. The first one is a positive action. So you get them to do something. So they do something naughty. So you get them to do something good, like a good deed, a chore, whatever. It's no big deal. Then if they won't do that, then you do the negative deprivation. You take a toy away. But if they're under three, they're, that's not the behavior board because they can't. the behavior board starts at three. Under three. Um, it's a little bit different, but if they're three and above, this is the behavior board. So you don't take anything away until you've started with the positive action one. They won't do it. And you always put a time limit on it. Uh, sweep the kitchen floor within 10 minutes of being asked to do so. Always put a time limit on it. And if, then the, it's 11 minutes. Okay, let's go to the board. Was, I'm going to do it now. Well, it's too late. It was 10 minutes was up a minute ago. So, so media blackout or whatever starts now. So you see how that works. You never just go to the de deprivation one. That's your second stop. And also, if you're going to take advice, from, and I just say this because it's just sort of a public service. If you're going to take parenting advice from someone, they have to have two criteria or I wouldn't listen to them. Number one is they have to have finished the job. Have they lived with teenagers? Have they got young adults as kids? Like that's your PhD is when you finish the job. Well, that's actually not your PhD. Your PhD is have they had experience with hundreds of other kids too? Put those two things together because my kids are relatively easy. All I had to do was maintain the respect I earned when they were like three, right through the teen years. But it's all those other hundreds of other kids that all sorts of issues. Those are the ones who taught me most of what I what I learned. So those are the two criteria. They have to have finished the job with their own kids, lived with teenagers, because that's a different beast. And then they have to have worked with hundreds of other kids. Otherwise, it's like to, if you're just listening to someone who has little kids about parenting, how do they know if what they're doing today is not going to backfire down the road? Because a lot, a lot of what works with little kids builds resentment, and it comes shooting out later on, especially the teen years, tween and teen years. So yeah, it's like taking advice from someone for financial advice from someone with ten dollars in the bank. It it really is experience based. It just is. Don't praise them. You can praise them, but that doesn't get good behavior. Sure, you can praise them, but it doesn't get you what you want. That's the thing. Praise is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but it just doesn't get you anything. Look at it. Like look at it like this. Let's say you got a little kid and you say to them, 
You're wonderful. You're special. I love you. Everybody loves you. You're so, you could do anything you want. Okay, I'm going to go do the dishes now. This is the kid. Nothing, nothing. You look at them, nothing. This is the difference. You say to a kid, but parents tend to overpraise and underplay. Play is their love language, not praise. This is what you say to a kid if you want the result. You say to a kid, hey, what are you doing? Can I play too? Look at their face. See the difference? That's their love language. You get good at connecting with kids and they'll look up to you. They want to please you. That's leadership. You meet their needs and you manage their wants. The, the managing their wants is the discipline. Meeting their needs is playing with them. Enter their world. Show them respect by watching them play and joining in. Praise is overrated. It's okay, but it doesn't get you the results you want. It's just so overdone. Oh, you're wonderful. You're special. You're this and that. And they're just looking at you like, yeah, can you play with me? No, I'm busy. I got to go do the dishes. You see? What does that do for them? It's just overrated, very much so. Uh, okay, what motivated you to start coaching or create courses? Okay, I started coaching before I ever did a course. Um, I only did courses just a few years ago. Anyway, um, I started, well, I'll just tell you my story very quickly because um, some people on here want to be a coach and they've asked me to help them, but I can't do that because I only teach through experience, right? And uh, anyway, so I started volunteering in daycare centers when I was 11 years old. I always found kids interesting. And the daycare ladies, I remember I was 11, it was a grade six. And the daycare ladies would ask me, they'd say, how do you do that? You get such good behavior out of them, but they want to be with you all the time. I didn't know how to answer that. I obviously kind of just had that leadership thing figured out from day one, uh, from that young age. And then when I was 20, I thought, well, I'm going to be a child psychologist because, you know, obviously that's what I should do. And then I signed up for a course and they kicked me out after a week because I asked too many questions. What they were teaching back, that would have been about 1980. What they were teaching back then was just garbage. It was always trying to outsmart the kids. It was so holier than thou. Like it was just, I thought it was patronizing. I couldn't stand it. And then the other students in the class started asking me questions about kids. So they couldn't get rid of me fast enough. You know what I should have done? I should have held out and asked for double back. But anyway, thank God I never became that. Because I would not I would never have been any good learning from in a classroom. I went out in the field. I went in hospitals, psych wards, um, school, tons of schools. I got some clearance to go into homes and support teachers who were, or parents who were struggling in homes. So um just to, uh, so I learned through kids. Kids taught me all this. And then when I was mentoring troubled teens, they said, you got to teach this, Lisa, because no one's ever talked to us like you do. And, um, and then like 25 years later, I started my business or 20 years later, whatever. So, but yeah, I think it was just sort of meant to be, you know, I'm not good at a whole bunch of things. Like, you know, some people are great at a lot of things. I'm not this, like, if not everything comes this easy to me, this always just kind of came easy to me. I always just kind of, because I was really interested in it. I took a real, and I never wanted to outsmart kids. I studied them. And I sort of was good at entering their world. I was really good at figuring them out and entering their world so that they would listen to me. Yeah, that was sort of what I did. Anyway, I loved it. Six-year-old with ADHD. Okay, I learned all this. Most of what I teach, I didn't learn with my own kids because I got respect when they were tiny and kind of sailed right through the teen years. But I, I teach you how to get respect, not how to maintain it. Maintaining it's easy. Getting it's the hard part. But I've worked with tons and tons of kids. I would say most of them probably had ADHD because no one ever said, here's an easy one, Lisa. They all went, good luck with this one. So they all had ADHD. That's where I learned all this stuff. It's consistency. It's mixed with a lot of fun and humor. But it's, you know, I don't, I don't take any crap. But I also mix it with a lot of fun. I address bad behavior and then I focus on the good kid. Where you put your focus, where you put your energy is what grows. If all you're focused on is the bad behavior, it will grow. It's like you're fertilizing it. Okay, Attention is a fertilizer with kids. Uh, wherever you put your attention is what grows. So be really careful with that. That's why we don't give tantrums any attention. Um, yeah, You never discuss a tantrum before, during, or after. There is no point whatsoever. Uh, some of my clients, the ones who argue this with me, uh, one in particular is a child psychologist. We got into it and we got into it about two things uh, that you got to, you got to discuss a tantrum. And what was the other one? Uh, oh, I can't remember right now. Oh, praise. I said, praise never gets good behavior. We argued that one too. We had, we had a blast actually. <laughs> it was a really fun client. But yeah, I argued that praise doesn't get good behavior. And I, I feel I won both arguments and I, maybe that person felt they won them both. <laughs> I think we kind of said we got to agree to disagree. But they hired me, so they're going to get my opinion.
Oh, sensory issues with their clothes, shoes, and socks. It's very common. It's up against their skin. Um, I don't know. Like, it's so different with each kid. And you got to, okay. What was it? Oh, I just remembered this. I was working with a client. We were trying to come up with something. This kid couldn't handle something. I think it was the elastic on the underwear. So I can't remember what it was. Just couldn't handle it. It was just too much for this kid. So we got out um, the parent. They were using uh, some kind of really like lanolin or something. And they were rubbing it on the elastic, I think, and it helped. Like they were, and they got the kid involved in it. Like, here, we're gonna fix it. So you'd be really positive about it and say, I know this bothers you, we're gonna fix it. You can, I don't remember what it was. I think it was just pure lanolin or sheep's oil or something, sheep oil or something. I can't remember what it was, but it was really, like, really gentle, but it was like a lanolin. And they rubbed it inside the clothes and it helped. So, um, yeah, that was, I've forgotten about that. That was a while ago. I think I just talked to a client today about that too. So, Forgot to mention that. Um, anyway, okay. I need help with bedtime. She's three years old. Check out my bedtime battles course. That's one of my mini niche courses. It's up in the link above, and it, there's, it's in two parts. It's a whole system. It's in two, two parts. The first part is how to get them in bed. That's the easy part. The hard part is how to keep them there. It's usually one night of sheer hell, but it's worth it. You know, you got to go through the storm to get to the rainbow. Um, oh, that's it. Short-term pain for long-term gain. That's it. I was talking to a client the other day and I couldn't think of that term. I, I used to say it all the time and I just completely forgot it. It's short-term something. What? Yeah, I couldn't, she couldn't think of it either. Short-term pain for long-term gain. A lot of this is like that. It's going to be really difficult in the short term, but it's worth it in the long term. Okay. Nine-year-old hates homework. That's okay. They don't have to like everything. Don't be the pleaser parent trying to make everything fun. Say, so yeah, sometimes you have to scrub a toilet. Actually, that's a bad example with me because I love cleaning. Actually, I actually like clean bathrooms. <laughs> I, I, I clean my whole bathroom every single day, sometimes twice a day. I'm insane. Anyway, uh, so yeah, sometimes you got to do things you hate. That's okay. You got to learn to do what you need to do before you can do what you want to do. So I would say, sure, you can watch TV tonight as soon as you've done your homework. And my kids never argued because they understood you got to do what you need to do before you do what you want to do. It's really good to teach children to do what they hate that has to be done. Everyone says, how do I make everything fun? That's the pleaser parent style. You're going to raise self-entitled snowflakes with mental health issues because they don't know how to do anything difficult. I don't want to pay rent because it's not fun. I don't want to pay my taxes. You know, you got to teach them. They got to do some crappy stuff in life. That's normal. When my kids were 15, I made them both go out and get part-time jobs. And I was praying that at least once they'd have to scrub a public toilet. And they both did. <laughs> That's good for them. How do you address an eight-year-old who's obsessed with video games? Very, very common. That's I hear this every single day. So I would do a media management system. Media management, I think there's three ways of dealing with it. Two of them are okay. I don't really like them. Um, but one of the two of them that I don't really like that much, they're okay. One of them is you have a, an allotted time per day. So between seven and eight every day, you can go on screens. The other one is you have an allotted amount of time every day. So you get an hour a day. I don't really like either one of those. I like this other one because you're sort of teaching the children how to self-discipline. What you do is you say you have, let's say for an example, you put 10 hours hours a week you can go on screens if they're 10 years old I don't know how you, how you do that that's not the point not how many hours just set an allotted amount of hours per week and you say now you're in charge of it so if they use up all their hours by Wednesday or Thursday they've got no screens over the weekend so they'll learn the first week might be hell but that's okay follow through on it and uh, yeah I call that media management get them to you don't want to micromanage your kids all the time you want to give them some responsibilities that's one of the best ways to do it is media management Anyway, and you write it all up in minutes. So let's say they've got 10 hours a week. I would do a whole chart and I would do like 600 circles on that chart and cross them out for each minute. Just make it like a big, like this is a real big production that you're doing. Only you can cross it out. They're not going to want, they're not going to want to cross it out anyway, but keep track of the minutes because it might not be one hour. It might be minutes, right? It might be 35 minutes or 24 minutes. So yeah, it's a lot of work, but yeah, it's worth it. It teaches them to take control of themselves. Do you have a course for four-year-olds? Yes, I do. That's the boot camp course, three to 12 years old. So toddlers are crazy. I'll probably never have a course on toddlers. They're just kind of nuts anyway, because um, they're just forming. They're brand new, fresh human beings. I have a bunch of little mini niche courses, though. Tantrums, toddlers who hit, potty training, bedtime. I have those four niche courses. But an overall toddler course, I don't know. I can't make sense out of them, so how can I do a course on them? Although I probably will one day. But anyway, the teen course I will hopefully do one day. Just It's just time. I'm, and I can't uh, push myself too far because I'll burn out, right? Being a pleaser gives them the lead. And they don't even want it. That's 
the thing is children deserve to have a leader. They need, crave, and want a leader. They're kind of lost without one. If you're not a leader for your children at home, you're sending them out in the world very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to peer pressure, bullying, the drug dealer on the corner, the internet, the Kardashians, because they're going to instinctively search out a leader anywhere else. That's why you want to be the leader at home. Also, it keeps them on the straight and narrow when they're teenagers because they tell you everything. When you're a leader, they tell you everything because you're a safe place to land. They trust you. They look up to you. You're like a mentor to them. So imagine this. If you've got a teenager who knows they're going to tell you everything, are they going to go off the rail? No, because they know they're going to have to tell you about it, and they look up to you. They respect you. Whereas the pleaser parent is so busy. The pleaser parent, this is a typical example. I probably shouldn't say much about this because in case the parents are watching. Uh, it's someone my, my daughter knew that she went to school with. And the mother, uh, the popular mom, you know, the cute popular mom, she posted a picture on Facebook of her and her daughter. I think the daughter was 15. Her and her daughter at the movies sneaking a bottle of wine in and drinking it. 15-year-old daughter. What a cool mom, eh? <laughs> That's the pleaser parent. Trying to be buddies, trying to be popular, even getting her daughter, 15-year-old daughter drunk at the movies. How stupid is that? Well, one thing that I want to point out is just a, a little tidbit information um, is apologizing. This is something that comes up a lot in coaching. And I teach parents how to apologize to their kids. And let's say you do something wrong and you got you to teach your kids how to apologize by doing it yourself. So let's say you make a mistake. This is how you apologize. There's four steps to apologizing. You say to your kid, the first thing you say, or anybody, an adult, this is how you apologize. You say, I'm sorry. I don't really care about empty words to me. Like I'm waiting for what's coming next, right? I'm sorry. Okay. So yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. It was all my fault. I shouldn't have done it. Don't say it was all my fault. I shouldn't have done it. But if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done it. You know, they, people tend to blame the other person when they mess up. It's just weird. The third one is make amends. Say, what can I do to make it up to you? And then offer something. Hey, I'm sorry I was late. How about I buy the popcorn for the movie tonight? And then don't keep doing it. That's the fourth step. Don't keep repeating the same mistake or else that apology meant nothing. Um, so yeah, four steps to apologizing. A lot of adults don't know how to do that either. Um, but yeah, four steps. Sorry, it was all my fault. What can I do to make it up to you? And then stop doing it. you got to learn to do that with your kids too. I, I am good at apologizing. Um, and I remember my teenage son, he's the one who always came back with stuff. Um, I said, I'm really good at apologizing. And he said, well, that's because you've had so much practice. <laughs> and then one night we were laughing. He was like, I don't know, 18 or something. We were up, just the two of us up late. We were just chatting. And uh, so we were, he was, we were laughing at all the dumb things I've done as a mother and just stupid stuff I've done. And then uh, I said, and I said to him, he's like 18 and we're just laughing away at all the dumb things I've done. A lot of cooking stuff because I've made some horrendous, I hate cooking, made some horrendous meals. Anyway, and then I said to him, what about all the great stuff I've done? And he went, what? <laughs> they tend to remember all your mistakes, but they don't tend to remember all the good stuff you've done. Yeah, kids are adorable. How do you teach your kids to stand up for themselves, not scared of confrontations, not be scared of confrontations? Uh, there's a difference between a confrontation and, and taking care of business, and I'll tell you how I do it. I don't like confrontations either. I've known some snarky people in my life, and I've learned over the years how to deal with them. Um, one thing I say is if they keep coming at me and insulting me, and you know, especially those passive-aggressive types, they're very, very sly. Um, I remember once my mom told me someone, she was wearing a yellow dress and some woman said to her, Lillian, can you wear yellow? Like, <laughs> and my mom said, you tell me, you're the one looking at me wearing it. <laughs> so my mom used humor. Um, what I do is if someone keeps coming at me and they're being really rude, uh, your kid could say something like this. Like if someone's being rude to them, I, this is what I say. If they're being rude, why do you do that? Why would I just say crazy Lisa shuts them right down. So yeah, he could just say maybe crazy Johnny or whatever. Who knows why I do think why I do what I do. Don't get caught up in, in defending yourself. If someone's asking you to defend yourself, don't do it. It's a power trip for them. Why would you do that? Shouldn't you be doing that? Crazy Lisa. Boy, that shuts them up. It's a good one. Oh, is there a bad side to buying my kids too much? So spoiling kids with things, they tend to not respect stuff or they tend to not have a lot of gratitude in them and they tend to be more entitled. So to think that they deserve all that stuff. Whereas I always said to my kids, if you ever ask for something, like a treat is a surprise, but if you ever ask for something, then it's just me filling a demand. So I didn't give them a lot of treats. Like I didn't tend to buy them a lot of extra stuff, but we spent quite a bit of money on experiences. 
like went to water slide parks, theme parks, all that kind of stuff, you know, went to stuff that, um, yeah, that we tended to do experiences. And you got a three-year-old who hit you in that, check out the boot camp course. That's all about your leadership. They don't act like that when you're a leader. By the age of three, the, at the age of three, there's a fork in the road. Uh, they're watching you when they're toddlers. And if you're acting like a leader, you're disciplining them by using consistent corrective action. You're playing with them a lot in their world. That's leadership to a toddler. They're starting to get it. But their behavior isn't going to be great until they're about three. All of a sudden, if you've been a leader and doing these things I just mentioned at three, they get super easy because they stop and think, wait a minute, you're a leader. This is great. I'm, you know, and they just, they're easy. If you're a pleaser, what do you want? Do you want this? Do you want that? And that's, you know, you, you, you do the pleaser parent. You know what I'm saying? You just cater to them and give them everything they want. You don't discipline them correctly. You're using, you're not using consistent corrective actions. You're using words, the mini therapy sessions. Then they take the other fork in the road. They go, wait a minute. You don't know what you're doing. I think I'll lead. I think I'll be in charge. It's almost exactly at three. It's not usually before three. It's maybe a little bit three and a little bit above that, that, that fork in the road. So yeah, check out. That's why the boot camp course starts at three. That's when they can stop and think before they act. They're starting to put things together. They're starting to figure stuff out. I'm such a pleaser. Yeah, it's a real popular way to parent these days. I hope it's going out of style. That started about 30, 40 years ago with participation awards. I remember the first time I heard about those. You mean you just turn up and you get an award? Oh, yes, of course. They all deserve an award. I'm like, huh, this is a disaster. <laughs> it was like one. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. You just turn up and get an award. Yeah, how stupid is that? Anyway, what was so funny about that is when I first heard about that, I had a, a, a or one, anyway, one time I had a, I don't know if it was, not when I first heard about it, but anyway, I used to have a column in the province. Uh, it's a newspaper here in BC, in Canada. And it was a Q&A thing where people would ask me questions and I'd answer, you know, like a Dear Abby kind of thing. So anyway, one, and I just read a column in the newspaper about this mother who in America, in the United States, she was suing the school because they didn't give her child a participation award for turning up to, for, for sports day. The child didn't even go. They didn't even participate. And she wanted her child to get a, she was suing them because their child didn't get a participation award for not even participating. I couldn't believe it. I wrote this huge thing on it. <laughs> I just thought it was the most disgusting thing. Anyway, that's the pleaser parent. There you go. It's a total disaster. Total disaster. Um, yeah, participation awards. That's the, if you're a pleaser parent, uh, you're going to raise self-entitled snowflakes with mental health issues. They're very, they're victims. They're woe is me that you didn't validate my feelings. I'm just a bus driver lady. Like that's what you're going to raise. They're just icky people. So you don't want to be the pleaser parent. You're trying to roll out the red carpet for them. You're a dish rag. They wipe their feet all over you. They never respect you. They resent you and they never, they never even grow up to respect you. The old fashioned authority style they, it works pretty well in the child years, but then the teen years, they tend to rebel. But they often shoot out the other side, respecting their parents and appreciating what they did for them. With the pleaser parent, they never respect you. They shoot out the other side. They're worse than they ever were. So, yeah, it's a total disaster.